everybody that is here. I am Astar Dawood. I am the content development and communications coordinator at, at SALT. And we are very excited to have all of you here to chat about the new digital learning um, platform called Brightspace that UCP has recently adopted. Um, this is more of an information session, and it is the first of many of the information sessions that we'll be hosting over the coming months. And it's about keeping everybody as updated as we possibly can about the new platform, about the migration processes. Um, and it's also to answer any questions that you might have, any concerns that you and to address any concerns that you um, also might have about the process um so how we'd like to work so stephen will be presenting um if you have any questions please pop it into the chat um and we'll try to answer as much of the questions as possible um so um how it will work is that stephen will present and um we'll try to group the questions together shanadi um Kavanda is also in the room with me um so we'll try and group as much of the the questions together as we possibly can. Um, I know that we've only got an hour, so whatever we cannot get to, um, we will try and send a follow-up email post the session and try and answer and at least any of your comments or concerns um, as much as we can. Um, so Shannon and Stephen, is there anything you'd like to add if I've left out um, just before you start? Uh, that's all good. We can get stuck in. Okay, over to you, Stephen. Okay, thanks, colleagues. Thanks, everyone, for coming. So this is about the new Brightspace, Desire to Learn Brightspace. And uh, this is a brand new logo they've just unveiled, and it's coming. And you might not have heard about this last year. Um, there were a couple of announcements, but we understand communication overload, and it was a crazy busy time. And so we hope you've had a chance to catch a breath after the start of term. And we're now launching into this exciting project and it's coming to you soon. So to put this in a bigger context, the Brightspace adoption is part of the Learning Platforms Update project, which is um, has this as its core objective, but is also bigger than that. And this is part of um, evolving our online learning platforms for UCT's teaching needs looking over the next decade. And there's a link to our website there. I'm going to put the link to these slides in the chat soon. Um, and how we got to Brightspace was by following a year-long process last year, which uh, was a formal structured process through a request for proposals and a tender process, which is quite detailed and rigorous, and that went to UCT Council. And um, that recommendation was communicated by the VC in the VC desk in, uh, I think, around the 9th of December. Um, but uh, many people might still not have heard about it. And so we're catching up with the campus community on this. So the time frame is we'll be migrating from Bullet to Brightspace over the period of a few years, concluding by the end of 2024 and 2025, um, all courses will be on Brightspace for online teaching purposes. There are some other components to the project as well, including looking at course evaluations, online assessment tools, and virtual meeting solutions. And the goal is to tie all of these into a well-integrated ecosystem that meets most of the online digital blended learning, teaching and learning needs um, on, on campus in a coherent, integrated way. So uh, one of the first questions we usually get is, well, why are we doing this? And people were particularly sensitive last year about big changes in a very stressful time for university and for everybody else. Um, so this project predates COVID and ERT, in fact, and we launched it formally in 2020, just before COVID, um, for two big reasons. One is looking at the management of current risks around our learning platform, and the second one looking at the future needs. So the risks are partly around on-campus hosting and moving to a cloud-hosted solution for availability and continuity reasons. Um, the second one is looking at, at 
moving to having more of the core basic services managed by a vendor for us, contracting this as a service, which frees us up to focus on higher level concerns. And the third one was looking at the long, long term sustainability of Sakai, which was the, the which is the open source project behind Vula. And we're concerned about a shrinking user base of that project, which is kind of a reinforcing cycle about declining investment into it and what that meant for it remaining relevant and current and competitive. Um, it's also the case that the platforms and the technologies are evolving very rapidly. So it was a good time to look at the whole market and landscape again. In terms of UCT's future needs, we have an increased focus on blended and online learning, and that's obviously accelerated dramatically over the last few years. Prior to COVID, we had more demands coming in for fully online courses, and that wasn't something that, that Fuller was particularly well suited to, but we also didn't want to fragment the solutions into running different platforms for different purposes. Um, and the sense that there are a lot of newer um, systems out there and we needed to look at across all of them as a comparison. So that was what the process last year was set up to look at. It was um, detailed and very thorough. It involved lots of different data sources. We started out by asking for faculty stakeholder representatives that formed quite a large group. I think this is probably one of the biggest RFPs ever run at UCT. We also did university-wide surveys and focus groups, and we presented to all of the faculty boards last year. Um, nevertheless, it still somewhat came as a surprise to some people, and particularly people thought that we hadn't consulted widely enough or get people informed. Um, partly, we were not able to talk in detail about the RFP process while it was underway because of the confidentiality rules about um, procurement processes. But we are very glad that that process is finished and signed off and we're now able to be fully open and transparent and tell you in detail about everything as it happens and answer all of your questions fully and in detail. So these are some of the key points to keep in mind. Um, Vula has largely served UCT quite well for the last 15 years, and Brightspace is the best fit for what we need looking forward. And it's not about any one single thing, but looking at a very large university with a very wide range of needs and um, looking at the directions and trends of future needs and matching up the best fit for that. So a best fit, again, is not necessarily a perfect fit for everybody. Uh, Vula was a great fit for some people and other people complained about other aspects of it. Brightspace will be a great fit for many, many people. There might be some ways in which people thought Fuller did something a little bit better, but by and large, we're very confident in this decision. It's a great product. It has some amazing capabilities and um, it's powerful and flexible. And so we, we think it's a very solid, well-supported choice. And it was a unan unanimous consensus choice from the evaluation pro process last year. Um, what I say often is don't panic because that's the first question that's come up. Are we landing a big change here, which is going to have a lot of time demands on people and this is going to be difficult and, and miserable? We're going to make it as, as pleasant and as happy and, and exciting a process as possible. We're providing strong support for this. We'll support you through the migration process. So um, there is a change coming but it's going to be a positive change with many opportunities for uh, benefits in that process and we're putting a lot of support behind it. So it's certainly not going to be like, here's something new, go and get on with it. Uh, we're gonna work through that process with you. Um, there are lots of new capabilities and improvements in Brightspace. So some aspects in which it's stronger than Vula or has things that we haven't been able to do well in Vula that we will be able to do in Brightspace. And I'll show a couple of slides of of uh, what that looks like and talk through some of them. Um, as I mentioned, there is always in this shift some things that are not exactly the same from the old to the new system. So there might be something that you do in Vula in some particular way or some tool that's like 
you become comfortable with and lined up with your workflow and Brightspace doesn't do things in exactly the same way. Um, and we will work with you to identify what those gaps are and figure out the, the best way to do those things in Brightspace. And in the migration process, we have an opportunity to evolve the course designs and adopt a more consistent approach to how courses are presented online for students. And this is one of the major things that students do say is their course sites are very different across lots of different courses and that makes it harder for them to find their way around and to understand what to do next when and in some cases those differences are important because they reflect disciplinary differences or the courses are being taught in different ways but in other cases those differences are, are kind of arbitrary and they're just roadblocks and speed bumps and friction for students and so we've had a very bottom-up self-service um, approach with Vula without strong support of the design stage and that's changing so we're doing a lot more work on um, template design for example and moving to one preferred way to present things and do things in Brightspace, which will create a more, um, again, consistent experience for, for students and also make things easier for staff because you won't have to wonder which of five different ways is the, the best way to do things. Um, and to some extent that will be reflected also in the faculty discussions around um, what those designs look like and uh, discussions around templates and the sort of alignment of courses and types of courses and departments and programs to, to templates in Brightspace. Um, and then lastly, we'll negotiate the migration timeframes with faculties. So um, we have a fairly um, relaxed approach to this where we don't have, uh, we have very few kind of hard and fast uh, parameters here, which means there's some flexibility to do this in a way which works well for everybody and aligns the resources and different interests. So these are some high level timeframes. We signed the contract uh, with the vendor at the end of January. We're in a process now of intensively working through Brightspace and its capabilities and the configuration and setup choices with the vendors and getting our own staff up to speed in SILT, um, developing deep expertise so we can make some of these design decisions well. We are in the technical implementation process, which is enabling sign up through single sign on the various integrations that we need. And this week we're kicking off the um, migration planning process with faculties. And that started with emails to the deans and deputy deans on Monday. And um, we'll follow up with a series of meetings, which my colleagues, Janet and Sam, and the SILT um, faculty layers on people who've worked with faculties through ERT and PDL will be setting up with, with faculty. So those will be happening fairly soon. And one of the goals there is to identify pilot courses for the second semester. Um, then we have a design process which is kicking off to look at the question around course site templates and um, kind of end-to-end -end process of the best way of presenting a teaching and learning experience on Brightspace in all its different aspects. Um, <clears throat> related to that, we will obviously update the um, support processes and documentation so that we're able to fully and comprehensively support your use of Brightspace. Um, looking at the tools and integration, so you may know we've introduced a number of <clears throat> pilot tools, including things like Gradescope, um, WooClap, Padlet, and Hypothesis, and we'll be putting those into Brightspace as well, but also looking at the overlaps and um, the right ways that those should fit into teaching design. And then the big topic is migration. And we're talking about this in two processes. The, the first part is kind of technical, which is just moving, converting, getting content and assignments and um, question pools and things that were in Vula into a form in which they're usable in Brightspace. But that's not the end of it, because then we will also work through a design update process to take courses that are in Vula and sort of present them or move them to a format that like logically fits into the Brightspace um, 
design and philosophy, which is around the course site templates and the questions around consistency, for example. Um, and, and that specifically is the, the process which will be supported by SILT with you. Um, so what we're planning at in timeframes is to choose somewhere between 30 to 70 courses in the second semester um, and, and this largely on a voluntary opt-in basis informed by faculties. So these will be our Brightspace um, pilot early adopters and they might help shape some of these site templates which will evolve again. We think the most obvious thing to do is to put all first year courses onto Brightspace for 2023 because we don't think it would make sense to be doing orientation for new students and teach them two different platforms. Um, that's the main reason behind that thinking. And then the timing of other courses we think should come through the faculty discussions. So there might be cases for con continuing to teach a course on Vula if it's a final year course or you take a particular cohort through or you might have a preference as a faculty for a kind of switch as early as possible strategy. Um, and we can look at all of those and there's some relationship with um, how much migration support we provide and, and what the timing of that is. But I can say that we have a great team in SILT that is gearing up um, to tackle this. So we have a, um, a very large amount of capacity going into this. We've um, engaged with ICTS and we have a lot of um, ICTS people on stream as part of the setup and integration and looking at the support side as well. Um, and so we, we're confident we'll be able to provide the resources to make this process work well for you. Um, I will just briefly talk through some of these slides and then we'll move into the Q&A. So these are some screenshots. Um, Brightspace is very beautiful, um, which is not the most important thing, but it certainly helps. So from a visual design point of view, I think it, it's kind of the class leader in its field. Uh, it looks very attractive. It's very visual, with clean design, but these designs are also very flexible. So they can, we, one can have different styles of presentations here for courses or community sites or um, different sort of versions of um, what the interaction is. This is kind of a, a course homepage version, which is structured around um, course units, for example, and the very top bar there is similar to Vula, but underneath that you're seeing a sort of thematic organization of activities in the course, which is also configurable. And one of the things Brightspace is strong at is tracking student progress and completion through activities. So you can see at the bottom that sort of completion um, bars there, which is showing students how they're working through the course. And that also reflects in the analytics that are available to understand how your students have engaged. Um, um, then also, again, strong personalization options for students, including a mobile app called Brightspace Pulse with push notifications and messaging and what's coming on next and what you need to do next. And this kind of card view of courses. Um, <clears throat> Again, showing progress completion there, tracking through different activities um, and some quite flexible content presentation options here. Um, this interface for authoring, so you wouldn't start with a completely blank template here because we would um, set up a number of different course templates to start from. But once you start populating this, this is a very friendly, intuitive way of kind of basically editing in place, dragging and dropping resources and items into different content pages and organizing them. Um, and then the assessment side, again, it has um, quite efficient online grading with um, sort of in-browser content views here that you can annotate, send feedback to students, um, things like video feedback, video and audio feedback. And then there's sort of two different uh, ways in which the grading can be reflected and assessed about the traditional grades view, which is kind of like Willa Gradebook, but also a mastery view where you can set um, competencies and achievements. 
and that can show up to students in different ways. And then this last one here is a predictive analytics module, which we'd be looking at introducing for um, next year when we have a large number of courses on, which is looking at risk factors and giving a, a risk score uh, presented to, to students and lecturers, for example. Um, so th there's um, a lot more that one could show, and I'm not going to do a live demo here because we will be setting up more opportunities to become more familiar with the um, platform. Um, if you would like to get onto it as early as possible, then we invite you to sign up to be an early adopter. And I put April there in as a date for um, giving sort of access to first UCT staff in that early adopter tool to Brightspace. And um, that might be in a situation where some of what we're doing is still changing in the platform and we'll be progressively um, heading to sort of stable configurations for second semester teaching on it. But that would give you your first sort of exposure and ability to try things out. And um, Shnali will be ramping up the um, seminar and workshops and training program around this. So that is it from the presentation side. And I am going to move on to questions. Thank you. Um, Stephen, would you like yes. me to offer you the questions in some kind of order? That would be great. Thank you. It will save me having okay. to scroll back and forth a lot. Sure. So there was a question from Klaus about the use of Brightspace in South Africa. So he's aware that um, TUT is currently using it and would mm -hmm. like to know who else is using it. And would you like to comment on that? Um, right, so TUT was the first um, large university to adopt Brightspace and they're extraordinarily happy with it. <laughs> um, and then the other South African adopters are, are a bit smaller than universities as an agricultural college um, and one or two others, which we um, did look at when we did the selections. Um, so we're the sort of second major South African university. I think that's the main takeaway there. Um, and then we, we spoke to some international universities as reference sites, including New York University, University College Dublin. Um, and there might have been one other uh, to get some quite sort of in-depth institutional perspectives on it. I wonder if Klaus wants to check in with anything there. Um, yeah, I, no, thanks, thanks to you. And I, I was just curious because I was, I was just wondering who the, who were blazing the new trail, or we were following someone else. But I see, I see, what is the new trails? Um, 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 I know Vitz has just recently changed to some other system, not not Bright Space, and it seems to have gone. Obviously, what lecturers are telling me. <laughs> so, so I'm just, just curious. To, to, was curious who else is using Bright Space? I see it's quite international, big footprint internationally in the US and stuff like that. So, yeah, let's just see. See what uh, I, I volunteered for the adopter a long time ago, so I'm, I'm quite keen to have a go and uh, at least reproduce what I do in Vula and so I start slowly and see how it goes and then modify it. Sure, that's great. We have a little cluster of questions around access. Um, there is a question coming from a um, couple of users around whether or not external users will be able to participate in courses on Brightspace in relation to a, uh, a jointly run program with UCT and Stellenbosch. A um, little bit more detail like that, um, or in relation to that, some, a staff member working in an institute, institute within UCT, but who does not have formal UCT courses, but still, still runs courses and makes use of Vula. So the short course question. Um, so two separate questions, Stephen. Number one, will external users be able to participate in courses on Brightspace? And question number two, what is our plan for short courses in Brightspace? Um, okay, thank you. So the external users has two dimensions to it. The one is 
people that we would add as research collaborators or external examiners or um, people who are somehow coming in to do something in the UCT context as a guest user, and that will continue to be supported. Um, we also have a slightly more flexible ability to define permissions and roles in Brightspace. And so we're hoping to be able to create an external examiner role, for example, that's a little bit better aligned to the requirements and what we're able to do in, in Vula. Um, the related question is about if you have other students in your Brightspace course, so you co-teach a course or you've got a cohort from a partner university, which is a little trickier because one of the differences in Brightspace is that we um, have a licensing cost that's pegged to the number of active students on the platform. So whereas we never had to manage this as Willow in any, there was no particular reason to manage it in a particular way. There is a implication for us as to how we manage these accounts and the life cycle of student accounts when they gain access, when they lose access, and then potentially the um, sort of ability to add students who are not UCT students. Um, so we will consider all of those um, carefully. I mean, our goal is to not lose any capabilities that you could do with Villa, um, except in the sense of there's some non-teaching applications of Villa that we think might move on to other platforms like Teams rather than move to Brightspace. But um, we're, we're taking all, all requests and all use cases and considering them in the design and the solutions that will form part of the Brightspace implementation. Oh, thank you. Um, um, oh, and the short course one. Yes, yeah. so, so we did include support for short courses in the set of requirements. Uh, Brightspace does have that. It has uh, flexibility around treating short courses in different ways from a presentation point of view, from a sign up um, branding, visual appearance, for example. So um, it's quite, in that sense, seems to be quite well short suited to short courses. There is also um, a component called Course Merchant, which offers uh, payment gateways, for example, or sort of shopping catalog type facilities. So that engagement we need to have with the various units or people who are running short courses to kind of now further define what their needs are and if they'd like to use Brightspace, what the configuration and setup might be for that. But it, it, it is definitely available for short courses and we're happy to discuss that with you about the best way to do that. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, that question came from Claire and I believe her colleague, Verena. Claire, Verena, does that respond adequately to that sort of pair of questions? Do you have anything you'd like to follow up on? Um, I just had one, one quick question. Um, you mentioned there might be a cost implication for the numbers of um, students or participants that get added to Brightspace. Um, I think it might impact us quite heavily, but I think it's good for us to know this upfront. Um, so we train upwards of 3,000 people on Vula per year. They are spread all across Africa. They have their own sets of staff within each classroom, but we manage them via Vula. And so it's, it's very much a blended model. Um, and so this might, might Im impact us quite heavily. Um, we might not be able to use Brightspace going forward, I'm not sure, but I think it's just good to know this um, and good to know about some of these you know, cost implications and perhaps we could cover it, um, but our students change yearly and so it might be quite a large cost implication, but that's for us, I guess, to worry about. Thank you. Um, just from my side, um, it's also a huge implication for us. We've, our center um, was established in 2012 and since 2012, we've had MPhil students at UCT um, and Stellenbosch and we're developing a new PGD program with the same model. So like Verena, it will also have um, yeah, serious implications for us. Thanks. So, um, I mean, I wouldn't take this as a settled question. This is not to say that we would pass on the costs directly to you. Um, it's simply that UCT is moving from not having uh, cost associated with student accounts to having 
a cost related to student accounts. So we've sort of gone in with a figure of 30,000, which is higher than our actual usage. There's some, going to be some flexibility around the, well, some variation around the margins around life cycle and edge cases and all of these things. Um, so, so firstly, there's no cost implication for people that you involve who are not students enrolled in courses. That's not an issue. Like there isn't a cost to add an external examiner or something. Um, and secondly, I think you should bring us all your requirements and tell us what you want to be able to continue doing. And whether that ends up with a cost model that devolves further down than just centrally getting it included in a central budget is a different question. So that might be a thing around short courses. We have kind of a provision of up to 10,000 short course users, for example, which maps quite comfortably to the UCT short course enrollment um, for courses that aren't on partner platforms like 2U. So we're not thinking there are any actual costs involved for short courses in the, the short term. And in fact, your other students could be part of that 10,000 maybe anyway. So um, I wouldn't take it that cost wasn't an issue and now cost is an issue for you. Just, um, yeah, we need to think through that and we'll talk through it. Um, but it's not, you know, we're not now saying you should stop doing every, anything that you currently do on Vula because now it's going to cost you that. We're, we're some way from that still as to whether it would in future or it might not ever. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen, I've popped a message into the text chat just asking people who are who are kind of specifically interested in that issue to mm -hmm. let us have your name in the text chat below, um, just so that we we can, you know, we have a group of people that we can come back to um, sure. as right. this issue emerges. So please folks, if you are, if you run a short course or if you have a course that faces an external constituency of some kind, please just pop your name in there and then we will add you to our list of people to specifically reach out to with regards to that. Okay, um, is it all right if we move on to the next set of questions? Um, right, thank you so much. Um, question about access, uh, will Brightspace be zero rated like Vula was? Um, okay, so zero rating is tricky. So firstly, zero rating in South Africa currently, we have it because of the state of disaster and the state of disaster disaster may be lifted and that would remove the legal compulsion on the mobile operators to continue providing it and there's some negotiation underway to see if we can keep that but it's not certain. So it's not certain for Vula and also even though Vula is zero rated when you start using the external tools then they're not zero rated anymore. Um, we have not directly pursued zero rating for Brightspace and again it may be possible in a certain limited way. So the general issue with cloud applications is that the um, you know, cloud applications produce scale and redundancy and reliability by distributing their content all over the world on the internet. And it becomes very, very hard to zero rate them because there are many different sources that the content come from, comes from. And we see that with things like publisher platforms, online textbooks, et cetera. So the zero rating position may get worse, but not necessarily even as a result of bright space, it may get worse, full stop. Uh, it's not a totally positive answer, sorry about that. Thank you very much. Cluster of questions around um, migration. Um, coming from Chris Van Klemper, uh, is it not possible slash preferable to move departments or faculties in one go. 30% uh, of MEC students, for example, bridge academic years. So students in 2023 and onwards would need to navigate two different systems if we migrate on a year by year basis. And then, yeah, maybe Chris is first, the others cluster a little differently. Uh, I think that preference is what we'd like to hear from faculty faculties. So if you have a strong preference, then um, express it and we'll do our best to 
enable that. Um, the trade-offs obviously um, around time and effort and all of those things. So if one favors student consistency, then move everyone to Brightspace from next year, then students only ever have one thing, but that might increase short-term workload for academic staff possibly who might otherwise have taken a more um, slower pace to it or not migrate all their courses at the same time. So those are kind of trade-offs which we think you're best placed to um, think about and decide on at a faculty and department level. And we we have noted strong interest in helping plan that migration and expression of interest. And we appreciate that so many people are interested in that discussion. So um, yeah, that discussion is coming to your faculty soon. If the meetings haven't already been set up, they will be soon. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a little cluster of questions around early adoption. Um, Sam has provided a link in the text chat for anybody who hasn't already signed up to be an early adopter to do that. Sam, if I could ask you to pop that link in again, that would be super useful. Um, but a couple of more general questions. Number one, what does it mean to be an early adopter? As an early adopter, can you do a dry run of your course of a, of a 2023 first semester course during the second semester? And then thirdly, if you sign up as an early adopter, are you committing to a time frame as to when your course will switch? So can you tell us a little bit about what early adoption in this context means? Oh, and one more question about early adopters. Can students be early adopters? Um, okay, so we have a couple of milestones about access to the platform. And um, our first milestone will be some internal thought stuff. Um, and that's happening very soon. And then we will grant access to um, UCT students and staff who fill in the expression of interest um, and tick the early access to the platform. So you'll then be able to log into it. Um, you'll be able to kind of play in a dummy sandbox site, for example. What you have access, what you see may change and evolve as we prepare the platform for the second semester. Um, and there would be no particular commitments that come with that process. We'd obviously be very interested in your feedback. Um, the, the commitment part is if you want to teach a course in the second semester, which is a, um, a pilot course um, and that essentially then commits you to well to teach that course obviously and and we would then work with you on the course conversion and migration process to um, essentially be an early adopter of the templates and the site designs and see how well those work for your course or the one you picked works for your course and um, possibly kind of evolve that incrementally. Um, so those are the two levels of early adopter. You obviously have a bigger um, commitment and involvement if you're actually teaching on the second semester. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah. sorry, just answering Anna's question. Mm -hmm. So we, we're sort of treating the GSB as a separate faculty in a sense for um, this discussion uh, planning process because the GSP's needs are quite uh, different essentially to commerce mainstream. Okay, uh, before we move on from early adopters, is there anyone who wants to clarify anything else about the early adoption process? I'm not seeing either, I don't see either hands or anything into the text chat. Okay, so can we maybe, I think, move on to our next little cluster of questions, Stephen, which are about tools and functionality. Um, and I think some of these are quite detailed. So I don't know how many of these you want to take now and how many of these you want to defer. Um, um, would you like to just point, <laughs> let point me, me let to me, a let name me send in you the chat them. and I can so read them? So Ernesto has a question about, will Brightspace support online and offline? slash online hybrid teaching models? 
Um, yes, but what that means exactly might take some exploration. So there is support in the um, mobile app, for example, for um, downloading content for offline access. So um, an offline in that sense means like no internet connectivity, but you might by offline mean face-to-face -face interaction in a classroom teaching situation. And also, yes, that is kind of core blended learning design. So absolutely. Thank you. Um, the next question is, will it be possible to easily transfer Vula lessons with embedded video and audio? Um, and then there are a couple of questions about quizzes. So I think we'll take those separately. Okay, so the video question is one of the design exercises we need to work through. There are quite a lot of different ways of doing video in Vula and in Opencast and in Teams and Zoom, both in how the video is recorded, how it starts life, whether in your um, home office or whether in a lecture theater or in a studio and how it then is processed and gets value added things like captions and transcripts and how students play it back. Is it a single video? Is it a two or three stream video like the open cast lecture ones with the camera view and presentation views? Um, Brightspace introduces some new video capabilities including direct recording into the platform and um, also on the roadmap is interactive video where you can put some question prompts into videos um, and some in-platform editing. So we will end up with good solutions for video in Brightspace and that will support video originated through several different ways. Um, and there'll be one preferred way of doing it and we will have continued support for captions and transcripts in video, both automated where you can edit yourself and high quality captioning provided by an external service. So that won't necessarily be a straight conversion across because you might have, for example, just uploaded videos into Villa resources as MP4s and we might move them into a like a different video hosting solution, but you'll still end up with videos inside content lesson pages and possibly more capable video than you had previously. Okay. Thank you very much. While we're on the subject of transferring things, a question about quizzes and question pools. Will they transfer easily? These are very time intensive to set up. Um, yes, this is obviously like one of the core, you know, you can't do that. <laughs> it's cheap. Um, yes. They will transfer. Um, there's some subtle differences in quizzes across the two platforms. And so there might be some um, review process to go through to kind of check that the quizzes and the questions are presenting correctly and working correctly and all of that. So I won't say it's just a close your eyes and start teaching, having pressed the button to move them across process, but there is a transfer process. Um, there is a health sciences um, issue around extended matching items particularly, which we're going to look through. And that might also be one of the issues around migration timing is that you might not want to migrate a course from Volo into Brightspace if there's some particular thing that is a gap that might take a little bit longer to decide how to fill that gap or to how, how to do things in a slightly different way. Okay, um, thank you. Um, question around integrate, well, what I think of as an integrating tools question, because I think we already have this functionality. Will Brightspace allow real-time quiz taking via their app? I'm thinking of in-class questions, whether you, where you ask the class if they think ABC is correct and then use that to gauge topic understanding. Um, is that going to be core functionality for Brightspace or are we going to continue to pull in a tool to the Brightspace platform that does that? Um, WooClap has been very popular and does a lot of things that aren't or beyond what's in core Brightspace. So I think chances are good that we'll continue to you know, also make keep WooClap available, um, which provides a lot of that live interaction um, 
capability, but there'd also be some ways of doing that directly in Brightspace um, in the same way that you could do it sort of with Vulo with polls and quizzes, just run them in real time. But um, WooClap has kind of got a richer repertoire of, of things there um, as well as Padlet. But yes, in terms of design and approach, those use cases are definitely in scope. Thank you very much. Um, so Hilton's given us an interesting problem. He's talking about the EXO accreditation visits um, and the kind of you know documentation and having to like in, move mm -hmm. things around and so on, and that that was very time intensive and difficult. Can you tell us something about the roles options that come with Brightspace that might mm -hmm. make something like this easier for external examiners, accreditation processes, and so on? Um, sure. And let me just say also that people have been concerned about whether they'll lose history on Villa. So we are aware that people do need to do this to go back five years or longer sometimes. And so you won't lose the history on Villa either. We'll keep Villa in sort of read-only mode eventually for a while, or we would export an archive. Um, as to if there's an easier way to do this that Brightspace might enable, um, we do have a more sophisticated capability with Brightspace around what's called an organizational structure. And so, for example, we can create faculty containers and set certain permissions and roles at a faculty level or at a term level. And so it's possible that we could, for example, grant a certain type of external access to all core sites within a faculty. Um, which one could have done manually with Vula, but would be possible um, with Brightspace um, in a, well, simpler way, um, a sort of more structured way, let, let's put it that way. So I think we'd like to hear a little bit about why it was so time intensive, what the, like, the sticking points were that made it difficult because we are thinking through the design processes now. Um, the, the kind of caution we've gotten from the desire to learn people is that there's a huge amount of power and flexibility here that is possible with roles and permissions and the organizational structure, but you may not want to use all of it initially because there is sort of a complexity cost of overcomplicating things too early when you're not sure if you're going to use something or not. So it seems fairly, there seems a strong case to me to put like a faculty level of organization because they're, you know, good cases where you want people to be able to see everything that's happening within a, within faculty course sites. Although that's also sometimes a potentially sensitive issue around ownership of courses and course conveners and, you know, what the, what the expectations and limits of, of that is. So um, we do we do have more capabilities. We need to think through them carefully. Um, we'd like to hear what was difficult and how that can be improved. And we're going to put up a what we're calling a sort of gap analysis and feature request form where you can submit those for things that you can do in Vula, would like to do in Brightspace, things that you couldn't easily do in Vula that you would like Brightspace to do, or things that you don't see how to do in Brightspace and you would still like to do. And then we'll go through all those and think through what the possible solutions are. Thank you. And if we could have squeeze in one more question. It's a kind of integrated question, it comes from Niklas and Warren. Um, and Niklas's question is about what are the possible integrations with the systems that um, the digital services in the library provide, i.e. data management planning, open, um, open data repository, digital collections? <coughs> and then Warren's question that relates to that is how, does, how well does Brightspace link to external ICTS tools, i.e. Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, and so on? Could you comment on those for us? Oh, okay. Um, well, the class, you should get stuck in with us and we'll make all this work. <laughs> so Brightspace comes with LTI integration, which is the first line of integration with standards-based external tools and systems, which um, supports Leganto, for example, which is one of the library systems. Um, we will look at 
the integrations and see where it makes sense and um, what um, what the right things are to do here. Um, the integrations, I can speak particularly to Teams, which is a um, strong integration. So it supports having a team site that is um, synchronized and complementary to the Brightspace site in that the membership of, of the Teams team will um, reflect your Brightspace course membership. So you wouldn't have to manage um, membership separately in two different places or kind of get your Teams to reflect your course in a sort of manual way. And in a Teams tab, you can make Brightspace show up, for example. So there are things that Teams does quite well that, um, and then you could use that in a like a complementary Teams Brightspace design. Um, and then we'll be exploring certainly the OneDrive and um, G Suite integrations. They're obviously supported to some extent already because they all go through single sign-on. So once you're logged into one, you're logged into all of them. And as far as PeopleSoft integration goes, we do want to do two new things that we don't currently do in Vola. One is to make it much easier to get midterm grades from the gradebook back into PeopleSoft as midterm grades, which supports um, analytics, early assessment, identifying students at risk um, progress. And the second one is to make it easier to get uh, final grades from Brightspace gradebook back into PeopleSoft to reduce where possible that cycle of kind of download a spreadsheet and then change it into a PeopleSoft format and then upload it into PeopleSoft. Um, so we'll be considering all of those integrations and looking at ways of raising the bar on them. Thank you very much, Stephen. That looks like the last of our questions in the text chat. And Stephen, I've just got a quick question for you in the text chat. Can we ask that last big pressing question um, mm. about the localizing issue? Oh, sure. Okay. So a question okay. we haven't settled yet is um, a name. So when we launched Villa in 2006, we gave it the name Villa. And in fact, it came through a naming competition and Jenny Whittle from EBE submitted the winning name and it was kind of a local UCT brand and people know it as Vula. So we have a question now about whether to do the same for Brightspace or whether to call it Brightspace at UCT. And we do have a question on the expression of interest form and we encourage you to fill that in and put in your thoughts on that expression of interest form. So it is something we need to settle um, quite soon because it would affect the final URL of the instance and um, you know that sense of what it is that you that students talk about that you're logging into um, and there are ups and downs of, of both sides so in one sense the support documentation is all pride space um, on the other hand it's kind of nice to have a local identity and perhaps communicates a set of values and um, feelings and the softer side around the platform and, and, and its identity. Um, so please do share your thoughts on that. If you'd like to share them now in the chat or to speak to it, you're uh, very welcome to do so. Otherwise, put them onto the form. Uh, we still have six minutes left if there are any final, final questions. If you think a local name is a good idea, we need a really good local name, you know, a compelling, this is what we should call it. And if you're here and listening in, please can I ask you to just pop a yes or a no into the text chat on whether or not we should rename. Um, and then you can put your name to thinking about your mind to thinking about what it should be. But if you feel like it should be like we should have, oh, those yeses are coming thick and fast suddenly, um, which <laughs> it's exciting. So a yes or a no. <laughs> and class is like, whichever. Um, uh, are there uh, questions I haven't answered that you would like to repeat for the next few minutes? No, I so can I ask the questions. I, I don't like typing too much. <laughs> Please go ahead. Um, so, so I, a lot of my my courses are design based, and a lot of the the marking is on on project submissions, so text submissions uh, with maths and equations, etc., which I then do. Off, I, all that offline. So I sit in an airplane or a coffee shop or wherever I am and I do all my 
grading offline and then when I'm done all the grading, I send it all back to Gula again. Will that be possible here? It, I've got a very streamlined process, so it's, it's very efficient. Uh, I'm wondering whether I've got the same here as well. Um, I believe it will be as efficient, and it's also a great scope, which I'd encourage you to look at, which lots of EBE people seem very, very, very attached to, uh, which helps particularly with some of those submissions that are paper-based or formulas or um, things like that. So um, I um, can't answer questions in detail about the differences, but we'll certainly pick those up. Yeah, see, the, the thing is that all requires online connection. I think I'm not mistaken. Great scope. All those tools require you to be on a on a on a 24 uh, internet connection. I'm talking about yeah, you're talking about the kind of download and then upload again yeah, after yeah, 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 life cycle. You want, which is very important. Um, in Maputo, for example, I have no access. So I have to have offline access. Uh, mm -hmm. time. You know, download, do something, when they're unconnected, get the stuff and upload the stuff. Um, I'm not going to answer that directly right now, but I'll ask somebody to just look into that and get back to you just because I haven't actually worked through that directly myself on the platform and I don't want to mislead you about what the differences are or how exactly it works. Um, but I would be surprised if the assessment process was worse on Brightspace than it is on Willa. Um, I'd expect it generally to um, maybe be a bit smoother. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, closing question or comments? Um, are you feeling excited or apprehensive? We're excited. Consult. It's been a while. It's coming to fruition. It's got lots of possibilities that we're um, thrilled to be working through. Great to see the excited. Martha's apprehensive. We have a fantastic team in Silk working on this, I can tell you that. So um, I think that's really very encouraging. And I also hope this is the last time I'm like a face of bright space because my talented colleagues who are getting much more engrossed in all of the details of this will be talking about this to you in future. So the first Thursday of every month, um, we will be hosting various guests who are in various processes uh, in relation to Brightspace. So there'll be people talking to us about integration and folks coming in and showing us what their pilots are starting to look like. Um, it will usually run at lunchtime on a Thursday. Um, so keep your eyes open for that. Um, and we will keep alerting you to it as we go along. Thank you so much to everybody who's made time in their very busy schedules to come in today and chat about um, will listen to us chat about Brightspace and to give us some questions. Uh, it is always wonderful to hear what is going on in staff heads around and student heads around what is concerns and needs. Um, we've popped in a couple of links into the text chat, including uh, the slides for today's session and the Silt Brightspace page, which will be an ongoing space for uh, communication with this and the broader UCT community. Thank you very, very much for everybody who joined us, to everybody who joined us today.